<laughs> I like the delicious feeling of uncertainty I get in your work. For a long time into Game of Thrones, when I st you start with Game of Thrones, I, there was a point I paused almost towards the end where I thought, is, is the magic that people are talking about actually real in this book? Because it's a long while before you see anything truly supernatural happen, like dragons are born. You see, there are white walkers, but you know, you think that, that, that might not be as supernatural as it seems. The, super, the supernatural world really creeps in very subtly at the edges of the world. And you've got gods in the book as well. Our gods, the new gods, uh, the Lord of Light. How real are the gods? Uh, is it giving too much away to say how real the gods are in the world of Westeros? Well, I don't, how real are the gods in our world? Um, a lot of people believe they're real. A lot of people have very intense faith in them, and uh, there are people who will swear that, uh, you know, prayer works and certain prophets, uh, be it Jesus or Muhammad or uh, whoever, could work miracles and raise the dead and walk on water and, you know, what have you. Um, are, are those things real or are those things myths? Um, we don't know, and I, 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 although my work is fantasy and it's set in an imaginary world, I want to ground it in realism. I, I look at the real world and I look at real history and I, I draw from that uh, for my parallels to hopefully give it the same sort of uh, verisimilitude there. I certainly don't intend ever to bring a god on stage in any of the Ice ah. and Fire books where a god will certainly suddenly appear. Like a genie uh, or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, there's fantasy that does that, but um, it, it, not mine because, again, the grounding in realism here I, I don't i don't really see that happening in in real life i mean we see events happening in in the real world that certain people who have a religious uh belief ascribe to their particular god or combination of gods but it's not provable that it was that it could have just been some other explanation and that's I, I like that sort of ambiguity since it occurs in real life I, I want to create that ambiguity in my fiction too so you know when something happens and some of my characters are very cynical about the gods be they the old gods or new gods but there are other people who are deeper deeply religious and have a lot of uh, faith and you know there's a there's a priest as one of the characters who follows a, a deity called the drowned god there's melisandre who's a, um, a priestess of um, of a fire deity the uh, the lord of light um and they're you know they're true believers uh they ascribe everything to the gods other characters like uh, Tyrion lannister are far more cynical about all of this one of the interesting things about the way I've structured the books, uh, you know, I have multiple viewpoint characters. It's a tight viewpoint structure where uh, I'm not an omniscient author. I don't tell you the way it really is. I put you in the skin of uh, one of my characters, and you're seeing the world through that character, and you're hearing his thoughts, but you only know what he knows. You only see what he sees. You only hear what he hears. Uh, and it's all filtered through his own particular worldview and beliefs. Um, so George R. R. Martin is not a god in the uh, Song of Ice and Fire in that sense? Not in that sense, no. Well, your voice isn't anyway, not the voice of the god. And sometimes two characters who are present in the same event have very different versions of the uh -huh. same event, of course, as you as you find in the real world. Uh, you know, any any trial attorney will tell you if you get two eyewitnesses, you get two different versions of what actually occurred. Um, so... You know, I try to include all of that in, in the books. There's a lot of moral anarchy going on in Westeros at the time. You know, the wicked tend to get on pretty well, and good men, like, you know, Ned Stark, die like dogs. Is is that how things... Is it a particularly bad time in Westeros when you're writing, in your mind? Or is this how things always are in this medieval world? Well, uh, you know, I think you you look through... The history of Westeros, and there are there are periods of peace and prosperity, um, but then it's it's not like this is the first time they've ever had a civil war, or the first time they've ever had uh, these sort of political machinations and murders and poisonings and so forth. That that occurs all through history, just as it does all through real history. There, there is such an absence of justice, it seems. Specifically, is this the time though? Is this is this how it is? Is this Part of winter is coming. Is this, this is the kind of climate setting, the kind of moral climate in the world? Well, um, 
First of all, the story is not finished, of course, the ice yeah. and fire story. So we'll have to see where things stand at the end of it. But, um, you know, I've I've drawn a lot on real history. Um, I've twisted it and turned it and, you know, added fantasy elements and combined elements of it. But still, the grounding is in real history and particularly medieval history, the Wars of the Roses, the Crusades, the, uh, the Albigensian Crusade. Um, the Hundred Years' War. And if you look through those periods, uh, you, you don't see a lot of uh, what you would call justice there either. Either You see uh, um, unending successions of, of murders and battles and l- people lying to each other and betraying each other. And, uh, um, you know, all this, all this uh, human drama being played out with, uh, with crowns in the hazard and uh, life and death on the line. I notice uh, that uh, given the uh, the medieval flavour of these books, I just wonder if you'd like to kind of imagine yourself what life would have been like in the Middle Ages with, you know, where most people's lives, they wouldn't have got wandered much beyond their own village. The only thing they'd hear all day would be bird song or wind through the trees. The only image they'd ever see would be an icon in church at the end of the week. Is that something you try to try to think about when you're writing? Well, I'd, I'd certainly try to keep, uh, you know, what I know about the, the real Middle Ages in, in mind. It is fantasy, so I could change elements, but I think you have to be very careful when you change things. You have to you have to think about every change you make. You can't do it. I, I mean, I read a lot of fantasy, too, and I, I, I love fantasy when it's done right. Uh, there's a lot of it that's not done right. That While they adopt the trappings of the Middle Ages, it's sort of a, a Disneyland Middle Ages where they have castles and princesses and knights, but they don't... It's there's no depth there. It's it's very uh, shallow. Um, yeah, the real Middle Ages was a tough time to live. I, I mean, you know, the historians have, especially the early Middle Ages, historians have moved away from calling it the Dark Ages as we used to call it, which I think is a pity because the Dark Ages were a better name for it than the early Middle Ages, which is one of these you know politically correct things. We don't want to offend any of our Dark Age people, but uh, they were pretty Dark Ages. Yeah. And uh, yes, there was some. There was the Church, which was a civilizing influence, and there were some things left over from the Roman Empire, which had fallen. But generally speaking, life in the Dark Ages was nasty and and barbaric and short, and certainly a lot less pleasant than it had been during the Roman era that had preceded it, which had been a far more civilized era with, with you know, better government and better hygiene and, um, you know, more of the trappings of what we would consider the civilization. Uh, when the Roman Empire fell, the human race really did go back, um, or at least Western. I mean, let's let's be clear here that um, there were things going on in, in the Americas and in Africa and in, certainly in Asia where, where Chinese completely unrelated to what was happening during the Dark Ages in, in Western Europe. But still, the Dark Ages were bad period and then we climbed out of it into the into the middle ages but it was still a difficult time there was you know the black death would come along every once in a while and kill three quarters of the people and uh, the systems of justice and and uh, were primitive and and did not really work for many people i mean if, if there was the class system um had real teeth. If you were a lord, you could get away with all sorts of rape and murder on on people of lower classes, uh, you know, peasants and serfs and things like that. Um, they they didn't have much appeal in practicality. They may have had certain rights in theory, but try to exercise them, and it was very difficult. It was a period of uh, there were frequent famines and starvation, and uh, most people were illiterate. Um, the the serfs were in the early ages were attached to the land, and even when they weren't attached to the land, they lived and died in their own little village. Like the next village three miles down the road was like a foreign country to them, let alone the only time they really got to see the world is when there was a war. And it was, I think one of the reasons that people, at least at first, eagerly would sign up when the king said, hey, let's we're going to go to France and have war against the Frenchmen. And, hey, well, get to see France and maybe get some plunder and, you know, get out of this planting the turnips and harvesting the turnips. Yeah, and no wonder the, the Crusades turnips. were so popular. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you, a lot of your characters seem very lonely uh, to me in the book. Do you think we're all a bit like that? 
Uh, sure. <laughs> I think that's uh, maybe that's just my worldview, but there's a certain existential loneliness. Right? We're all trapped in our own in our own heads. Uh, you know, I, in my early work, uh, long before Ice and Fire, I wrote science fiction uh, from the 70s. Um, and uh, I had a story, my first Hugo and uh, Nebula Award winner, the song for Laia, um, was about telepathy. And uh, that was always an interesting issue to explore in science fiction was, what if you could really know uh, another human being? You know, what if you could read their minds? Not just some treatments of telepathy, it's just like silent conversation where, you know, you're just reading thoughts that people are sending to you. But what if you could really go in someone's head and know all their secrets, know everything about them, every good thing about them, every shameful thing about them, all the all the uh, fears that they have, all the desires that they have, all of the the terrible things that they've done or wish they'd done or 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 dreams? Would you would it make you love other people more? Would there be total acceptance if you had total knowledge of another person, or? Would you go mad? Would yeah. would you hate yeah. everybody else? And would they all hate you? Because we would all see. I mean, we're all these complex combinations of uh, of good and evil. Um, but we have walls that we erect, and we we only show other people the things that we want them to see. And there's a certain existential loneliness, you know, because of the very nature of that. <laughs> 